Good morning to you all again. Good morning. We welcome you to our service today. This is the first Sunday after Christmas. And we're going to be singing uh, quite a few of the songs that we did not sing the other evening on Christmas Eve night. Uh, so follow along in your bulletin. We're not singing all of the stanzas to all of the hymns. And then there are one or two, maybe. But I have a question for you to start off the service today. If I asked you what today was, December 26, what would you say? No one would say anything? <laughs> what would you say? What is today, December 26? The day after Christmas. I thought that's what someone would say. Very good. And it is. When I was a child, I think it's still known this way. It's actually known as Second Christmas Day. And as a young boy, I recall going to church on Second Christmas Day morning. But there's also something else that is involved with this day. It's also known as, I saw someone, St. Stephen, lips. Lips go big over here. Yeah, it's known as the Festival of St. Stephen. Now, you've heard about that to a certain extent. Uh, it's included in a Christmas song, although you might not really have ever made that connection with this day in regards to it. The song that uh, connects with this day is Good King Wenceslas Looked Down on the Feast of Stephen. Are you familiar with that? When the snow lay round about, crisp and deep and even. Now at first the words don't sound very religious, and it's not really one of our most religious Christmas carols, but if you actually looked at the rest of the song a little bit, you could at least see perhaps a connection with today and the observance of the church on this day. St. Stephen's Day. December 26th has actually been celebrated within the Christian church for centuries. It goes way back in time. In fact, some feel that this festival might have even been celebrated before the observance of the nativity itself. It began not so much in connection with the birth of Jesus as much as to counteract the intrusions that were coming upon the Christian church because of paganism and because of its unchristian customs. To counteract that, the church on this day basically had the message, stand firm in the faith, just as Stephen did. Walk in the footsteps of Christ, your Savior who has now been born for you, even if it should cost you your life here on earth. And for centuries, that actually was the focus of the church on this day, December 26th. Well, today we're going to celebrate still the Savior's birth and the joy that is ours as the Son of God has now come into the world in the flesh for us. But on the second Christmas day here, we'll also commemorate the Feast of Stephen and the eternal hope that the church always held out to its people at the birth of Christ and by their faith in him. That's where you find the true Christmas faith and what it means for those who are faithful even unto death. So today the service has the thoughts of Christmas, faith, and a martyr's death. If you would join with me in the singing of our opening hymn, hymn number 442 in your hymnal. Hymn number 42.
We will not be singing the opening Amen here this morning. But our worship today is in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our confession of sins and the absolution today is going to be made up of two of the Christmas songs that we have. They're printed in your bulletin for today. Now sing, we now rejoice. And then that is the confession of sins. The absolution and then the song of joy that follows that is, To you this night is born a child. You recognize the tunes as you hear them. We'll sing from one to the next as we go.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, in mercy you sent your one and only Son to take upon himself our human nature. By his gracious coming, deliver us from the corruption of our sin and transform us into the likeness of his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. <clears throat> And we now turn our attention to the lesson, the New Testament lesson that is for today. Again, the second Christmas day from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. If you wish to follow along, you'll find it printed on the back side of your bulletin. <coughs> this is John's way of expressing the Christmas mystery. He does not give the details of the incarnation, but he speaks as to what the depth of the incarnation, meaning Jesus born into the flesh as God's Son, means for us in time and eternity. We read from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him everything was made, and without him not one thing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as an eyewitness to testify about the light so that everyone would believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The real light that shines on everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to what was his own, yet his own people did not accept him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They were born not of blood or of the desire of the flesh or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory he has as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him. He cried out, This was the one I spoke about when I said, The one coming after me outranks me because he existed before me. For out of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only begotten Son, who is close to the Father's side, has made him known. Here ends the reading of the Gospel for the day. And in response, we join in the singing of hymn 36, A Great and Mighty Wonder. Hymn 36.
Our lesson this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 6, beginning at verse 8, reading on into chapter 7, verse 6. Now that's a rather long lesson there. You might want to go home and read it sometime uh, during this upcoming week. I'll read just a portion of it, the beginning and the ending of it, so you have the thoughts that are reflected in the story about St. Stephen. St. Stephen was one of the seven that was chosen um, in the book of Acts shortly after the New Testament church had been established. Uh, one of the seven that was going to help out the widows and provide for the poor when the needs became so great within the church in Jerusalem that the apostles could not do it themselves. He was also known as an evangelist in the work that he carried out in the name of Christ. We begin in chapter 6 at verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced fault witnesses who testified against him. And from there on, the trial proceeds. Mostly, Stephen is speaking here. He speaks of the history of Israel from the time of Abraham through Moses and going onward, and how God had been faithful to his people and providing for all their needs and giving them the prophecies regarding the Savior that was yet to come. As he continued to testify regarding this, he also made witness of the fact that Israel so often had rejected God and his promises and uh, the ones whom he had sent, the prophets and others to inform them about all the things that were to take place. And he ended that portion of it by accusing them of rejecting God and his word. And these are the last words that he spoke before the crowd then reacted to him. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth against him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. In Christ Jesus, your fellow redeemed in our Lord. This whole account starts out by saying, Stephen, full of grace and power. Think about a fine description that is to place behind any Christian's name. Child of God would thrill to have that written behind him as describing what his life had been like. It's all because the birth of Jesus had really deeply affected Stephen and Christ's life. Now to begin with, Stephen is just an ordinary man. He was not a special one. He was not among the high ranks of the apostles. And yet, it says that he was filled with the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. I think that's a testimony to what the Holy Spirit can do with an ordinary person out of his grace and his mighty working within his heart and life. 
See, Stephen wanted to give something back to God in return for the wonderful love that God had shown him. And so he gave to God the only gift that he could give him, in one sense, himself. You know the hymn, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's what Stephen did. It was as though he said, it may be a poor return, Lord, to give to you, but it's all that I can give to you and my Savior, and I give it with all my heart. And God received Stephen's gift, and the Holy Spirit filled his life so much with his power that that demonstration of a Christian life was clearly seen in all that Stephen said and did. And that spark of faith that the Holy Spirit <coughs> worked within him grew into this great fire that set his whole life ablaze. He wasn't one of the close 12 apostles of Christ, but the power of the Holy Spirit was poured into him so much that it prompted a joyous confession <coughs> of his faith before others. People listened to what Stephen said about the Savior. And it began to alarm the Jewish authorities who had crucified Christ. They wanted to stop him in this preaching. I suppose they had thought to themselves, we have already taken care of this nonsense, and here it is coming up again in this man. We have to make stern measures to stop this. So they arrested Stephen. But they could not stand against that wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit that was within him. Fearlessly and boldly, he joyfully confessed his faith in the Christ who had been born in Bethlehem. But the authorities bribed witnesses to lie about him. This man, they said, has threatened to tear down our temple and destroy our Jewish faith. And the high priest asked, are these things true, Stephen? In the part that I did not read, after that was asked of him, they all turned to look at him, and they gasped in amazement. He was so filled with the Holy Spirit that his face shone with the brightness of an angel. Yet in spite of that wondrous sign and the words from God that they saw and that they heard in Stephen as he told them about the rejection that they had of the Christ child, they were enraged. They plugged their ears, they dragged him out of the city, they threw rocks at him until he fell at their feet. On this 26th of December, what should be our thoughts in light of this text? What should be our thoughts about Christmas, faith, and a martyr? Can you not see in Stephen the glorious effect of what faith and that babe that was born in Bethlehem means? When the grace of the newborn Christ fills the heart, it cannot be confined, but a joyous confession comes forth, even in the face of death. You know, a similar thing, not quite to that extreme, but a very similar thing happened to the shepherds on the hills of Bethlehem on the night that Jesus was born. After going to Bethlehem and seeing that newborn Christ, they told everything to everyone, to whomever they came to, all the things that they had heard and that they had seen as the angels had told it unto them. And Stephen here followed their example, even when death was staring him in the face. Like Stephen and the shepherds and all the saints of old, as we cling in faith to that Christ who was born for our salvation, we shall be willing also to have such a joyful confession of him, even if it should cost us our lives. We shall proclaim, for me, God has become a man, born into the flesh, so that I might have forgiveness and life with him. Enemies may try and take that from me. They may try and take everything that I hold dear in this world from me, but they can never touch or remove that Christmas joy that is in my heart and soul. Christ is mine, and he's mine forever. 
Let's continue with the singing of our next hymn. Hymn number 53, stanzas 1 through 4. Note the stanzas. Hymn 53, stanzas 1 through 4, to shepherds as they watched by night. because he has actually seen it with his own eyes. No mortal ever saw this before, not Peter, not John the Baptist, not Isaiah, not Moses, not even Abraham, and none has really seen it since, as Stephen did. But Stephen was permitted to see it all while he was still here on earth. And what do you think he saw in heaven? It's not really explained to us, but it does tell us that he saw his beloved Savior standing in all of his heavenly glory. I imagine as if he were welcoming home his faithful servant. His faith didn't waver, Stephen's didn't at that point, for he had seen with his own eyes what he had been waiting all of his life to experience. Now, what benefit is this to us, that this martyr had such a wonderful experience? <coughs> Why do we even consider that at Christmas time? 
Should we conclude that because he saw it and we haven't, that maybe he was better than we are? Does heaven open its door <coughs> to those who are the greater witnesses to Christ? Is the Savior nearer to him, but far from us? Some might be even tempted to think. No. What Stephen saw here is given to all the faithful, you included, just not in a visible way at this time. We too see the glory of God's Son, our Christ. We see it in the mirror of his holy word and in his sacraments. And there he opens heaven for us. He gives us the blessing of the salvation that he won, and he promises that that will never close behind or in front of those who continue to cling to him in faith. The one who receives this Christ in faith, that one sees heaven open. And the glorified Savior at God's right hand. Not perhaps with the eyes that are in our head, but with the eyes that are within our hearts. You see the Savior. Our Savior is ever ready to help to encourage, to strengthen, and to receive each believer to himself. Truly, in God's word and in his sacraments, faith sees heaven opened in Christ. And that is a true Christmas faith. We continue with the singing of our next hymn. Hymn number 57. Hymn number 57. <clears throat> Thank you. 
true Christmas faith conquers death and enters heaven. Stephen's persecutors surrounded him like wild beasts. They hurled stone after stone upon him, but his courage did not forsake him. He didn't plead for mercy, not for himself. Standing erect, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And the Lord whom he believed in was still his rock on which he would stand. And with Christ at his side, he fearlessly, joyously faced death. He faced death head on. There was no fear. There was no request that the Lord would save him from the hands of his enemies. There was no desperate plea that, plea that the Lord Jesus would keep him from such a horrible way of dying. No whining about the terrible way that this was to go. There was only a confident prayer that the Lord Jesus would receive him at the moment that he passed his life. There was no concern for himself, but there was concern for the souls of his murderers. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after that prayer of concern for the eternal welfare of others, he fell asleep in the Lord. Let's join in the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 41, Let All Together Praise Our God.
like Stephen will one day see their Savior face to face. Why? Because such a faith is rooted in the true meaning of Christmas. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And whoever lives by that truth will come into the light. That's the faith that John later on says overcomes the world. This is the true Christmas faith. Jesus who was born into this world of sin is my savior until death. And such a faith conquers death and enters heaven. For that we pray the second Christmas day on the Feast of St. Stephen. God grant it to us in faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. We join in the singing of our next hymn in number 68, Away in the Manger. <coughs>
Please rise for prayer at the blessing. <coughs> Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gladness that we have in the gift of your wondrous Son. You have given us the Savior. How great is your mercy, how unspeakable is your love that lasts forever. Forgive us our transgressions and the sins which have made us unworthy of your kindness. Remove from our hearts the many temptations and distractions which could rob us of the abiding blessings of the Christmas gospel. And fix our thoughts upon the heavenly joys which are always ours in the Christ child. Like Mary, may we keep all these things and ponder them in our hearts. Like the shepherds, after having worshipped the newborn king, may we return to our callings in life, glorifying and praising you. And like Stephen, help us to be ever faithful until you draw us to yourself above. May this be for us not merely a holiday, but a holy day, filling us with grace and blessings and strength from the Holy Spirit that we may carry with us not only through this festive season, but also out across the threshold of a brand new year. Be with our sick and those who are suffering. Keep them strong in their faith and looking to you for the special gifts of endurance and patience that you give. May we embrace the Christ child in the arms of faith always the days during the days of our earthly journey, evermore praising him and serving him until in your mercy we join the great angelic choir and sing eternal hallelujahs to your holy name throughout the endless age. We ask these things in the name of the Christ child whom you have given to us. And for all our other needs and the needs of our world, we come to you in the prayer that you taught us to join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we join in the singing of our last hymn, hymn number 64, Let Us All With Gladsome Voice.
Again, we welcome you all to our service today. Pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's word. Uh, today we'll not be having Bible class following the service uh, or the fellowship time, but we will begin that again next Sunday as we begin the new year. And you're welcome to come back again this coming, what is it, Friday? Is that New Year's Eve, Friday evening? 7 o'clock we'll have a uh, New Year's Eve service here, uh, communion service, as we close out the year in the blessings of the Lord and enter the new year. So we invite you back for that, and again next Sunday we'll resume our normal schedule. The rest of the activities that we normally have during the week will not have this week, just the service on Friday evening. Thank you. <laughs> 